Welcome back to Truth Shots, everybody. My name is Jeff Lyle, pastor at the church at Winder and your host and teacher on Truth Shots. I'm glad that you've tuned in today. You know, a lot of people are living their lives afraid of God. Now, I'm not talking about the fear of the Lord, which is biblical. I'm talking about living afraid of God. Do you know that is not God's will for you? And today, I'm going to walk you through several verses that may very well free some of you up for the rest of your days from living afraid of God. I believe that there's one primary reason why people, Christians, instead of living in freedom, joy, peace, and hope, are living afraid of God. That is not His will, but I believe I've diagnosed the reason why. And today, on this episode, Episode of Truth Shots. I want to talk to you about it. Let's get into the word right now. Okay, so I kind of set the table in that opening clip. Now I want to really get there with you. Why would somebody live afraid of God? Well, I don't think it's because they're terrible people. I don't think that it's because they're not saved. I don't think it's because, you know, that, you know, they just don't want to trust God. I think the primary reason that a lot of Christians are afraid of God is because they don't know just how forgiven they are. Listen, that's what I'm going to call this message today. Just how forgiven are you? Should you be so afraid of God that you need to avoid him lest he see something in you that doesn't measure up? You know, we never verbalize it that way, but a lot of Christians live that way. They, they have enough of God to give them some assurance that their sins are forgiven and they're going to go to heaven, but they don't have enough of the truth of the gospel to let them enjoy the salvation that they have. I believe a byproduct of dead religion, human tradition, and legalism and guilt-based preaching, I believe the result is that we have a generation, maybe two generations of Christians alive right now, whose primary disposition toward God the Father is that they are afraid of Him. So I want to go through some scriptures today, and I really want to help some of you. I'm putting on my pastor's hat today. I want to pastor you, I want to shepherd you, I want to help you today through God's Word to break down those walls that are causing you to live afraid of the one who loves you the most. And we've got to tear down some wrong thinking in order to build up some confidence that God is not coming after you in anger anymore if you are indeed in Jesus Christ. And listen, if you're not in Jesus Christ, if you've never repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus, I want to tell you. You should be afraid of God because the wrath of God abides over you according to the word of God. But here's the good, glorious news. We can deal with that today. You can actually leave after this program is over, no longer living afraid of God because you've come into his son, Jesus Christ. And I'm about to tell you what that looks like, what that means, and all the benefits of walking in Jesus and having that wall of fear torn down between you and God the Father. Let me open up with this verse from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Let me give you two Two verses here in verses 28 and 29. This is what the writer of Hebrews said. He says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Now, this is very important because I don't ever want to leave any of you with the idea that, well, Jeff's just kind of casual about God Almighty. Jeff's kind of flippant. He's kind of like milk toast. He's kind of lukewarm. He doesn't really know God. He doesn't understand God's holiness. He doesn't understand God's majesty. He doesn't understand God's power and God's hatred for sin. Jeff's just kind of loosey goosey with God. No, no, friends. I want to tell you, I believe in the biblical concept of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is very different than you living afraid of God. The fear of the Lord is expressed right here in Hebrews 12. It means we live with reverence and awe. It means though we, we, we understand God is immeasurably powerful. God is completely holy. He's altogether different than we are. We understand that, but we, we come to the place that we, we recognize that glory and that majesty and that awesomeness of God. It moves us to honor him. It does move us to obey him, but in love and gratitude, not fear. So reverence and awe is important. I don't want to have anything to do with a version of Christianity that just kind of casually saunters into the presence of God as if they were saying, hey, what's up, God? Or what's up, J.C.? I hate that kind of nonsense. That's not what I'm talking about. But equally destructive is the person that says they're in Jesus Christ, but they're terrified of God. 
They're afraid he's going to get them. So they're trying to do all this stuff to appease God, to show themselves worthy of God. And they just live at a distance from God and they don't enjoy God. Part of God's desire for the Christian life is that as we worship him acceptably in reverence and awe, we would actually enjoy him. He is, by his own declaration, a good father. He is our father. And many of you didn't have fathers, and many of you had bad examples as fathers, and maybe you even had abusive or perpetually angry or intense, hostile fathers. And because of that, you think of God the Father that way. Well, I'm going to appeal to you today, look beyond the earthly representation of what a father is, or look beyond that earthly absence of what a father should have been to you, and believe what God the Father says about himself and about you. So let's go on. We, yes, we're going to worship with reverence and awe. This is what the, the fear of the Lord means for Christians, but this is a motivating factor for us to live a life of trusting surrender, not a life of distance, not a life of unhealthy fear, not a life of being paranoid that God's out to get you. He's unpredictable and untrustworthy. No, 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 no. He's so good that his thoughts and intentions towards you are nothing but good. He works all things together for your good, the ones who are in Christ and who love him. Well, let me give you this because I want to show you that when you got saved, when the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you, very quickly here, the Holy Spirit lives inside of every single Christian. Some of you need to hear that. There's a line of thinking that's been around for a long time that um, people think, well, if, if this person doesn't speak in tongues or this person doesn't have supernatural powers, they don't have the Holy Spirit. That is is bad theology. The gifts of the Spirit are not the entirety of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of every single believer the moment he or she calls on the name of Jesus. And this is what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse number 15. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery that returns you to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now, let me unpack this verse a little bit, because it may sound strange to you if you've never heard it before, but it's a very important truth. Paul is saying here to Christians, the spirit that God places in you is not a spirit of slavery, a spirit of a, a slave who's afraid of the master. You know, in the Roman Empire, and that's the time in the first century when this letter to Rome, the Romans was being written, there was a massive amount of Roman European slaves, massive amount all throughout the Roman Empire. And so it was not uncommon for people to encounter slaves at all time. And most, most of the slave enslavement back in that day, as it was in the American slavery uh, uh, disaster that hit our nation and that was here for such a long time, the slave master were cruel. They were cruel. They treated the people as property, dispensable, disposable. They beat them in the Roman Empire. Sometimes they killed them. They would sell them. And it was, it was a horrible mindset. And a slave never knew where he or she stood with their master. And most of the times that master cared nothing for them. So Paul says, hey, when you came to Jesus Christ, you weren't a slave coming to a cruel master. You're a son or a daughter coming to a very good father. He says, you're not receiving a, a spirit of slavery that you return to fear. Now, that's a very important concept because those that don't have the spirit of God, those who are not Christians, they should have a fear of God. They should be afraid of God. Why? Because the scripture teaches that anybody that's not in Christ is in condemnation. That means you're on the wrong side of God's justice. That means you're in trouble. That means you're not doing things that are bringing trouble. You're already in trouble if you're outside of Christ. So you should be afraid. You need to run to Jesus, your refuge. You need to repent of your sin. You need to surrender to this glorious king who's out there looking to save you. And so those that weren't in Christ, they were under a spirit of fear. They lived in fear. But Paul says this, when you get saved, you get the spirit of God and he won't return you back to that slavish fear. So my Christian friend, let me just say this. If you're afraid of God, you're listening to the wrong spirit. You may be listening to a demonic voice. 
You may be listening to the spirit of dead religion and tradition. You may be listening to um, your own insecurities, your own fallen parts of you that haven't been sanctified yet, but you're not listening to the spirit of God because the spirit of God says, no, you are not going to live your life bound in fear of the God who went looking for you so he could save you, so he could embrace you, so he could bring you home. There's no reason for you to be afraid. He says, you actually received the spirit of sonship by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You see, the Holy Spirit, according to Romans 8, 15, when he comes inside of you, he brings this yearning and this longing to be close to God the Father. Abba, Father. Abba is an Aramaic word that was often used by children to refer to their daddy. It's a very precious term. And what Paul is writing here is the Holy Spirit that lives inside of every Christian is yearning to work through us as children of God saying, Abba, Father, I want you. Abba, Father, I need you. Abba, Father, I adore you. Abba, Father, come pick me up. Come rescue me. Come help me. Come provide for me. Come protect me. You see, a slave never had that option to do that to the master. The slave's life was nothing but fearful obedience of a, of a human being that had their entire life in the palm of their hand. And God says, no, I broke that off of you. That's not the way I want you interacting with me. You're not my slave. You're my daughter. You're not my slave. You're my son. And I want you to know that my door is open. You come into me. I am your Abba father. I am your Papa and I love you. So you've got to retrain the way you think about God, because if you think about God as a Christian in a way that's more like a slave to a master instead of a child to a father, then you've got to get your thinking straight. And that's why I'm giving you some of these verses. But there's more. Let's go on a little bit deeper. So in the book of Hebrews, again, we're going from Hebrews 12 to Romans 8, but back to the book of Hebrews, chapter number four, verses 15 and 16. Listen to these verses. This is speaking of Jesus Christ in the, in the context of him being our high priest. So speaking of Jesus, the right of Hebrews says in Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest that is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then come with confidence and draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy, that we may find grace to help in our time of need. Now, friends, these are some rich verses here. So we're seeing Jesus as the high priest, the one who offers the sacrifice on our behalf. And Jesus is the great high priest who offered himself as the sacrifice. And only one sacrifice of Jesus's life was needed. And his blood that was spilt was not like all those Old Testament bulls and sheep and rams and goats and turtle doves and all of that stuff. Those sacrifices had to be offered every single year because sin was never fully atoned for by animal sacrifices. But Jesus came as the substitute and the sacrificial lamb of God, the final lamb that ever needed to be slain. And when he gave his blood, he took away everything that might cause us to be afraid of God. Listen, the only problem humans have with God is sin. Sin is the only thing that keeps us away from God. And Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And by doing that, he took away the penalty and the power of sin. So as our high priest, he sympathizes with our weakness. Well, a lot of people think, well, yeah, I'm saved. Yeah, I've got the Holy Spirit. I love the Lord, but I struggle in this area or I struggle in this area, or I still haven't gotten perfect victory in this area. I've got weakness. And man, if God sees that weakness, then I'm going to be in trouble with God. And so a person that is struggling in their weakness, maybe it's moral, maybe it's intellectual, maybe it's relational, maybe it's some habit. And when, when they think about that, they think, oh no, I can't let God see that. So sometimes they run from the Lord and just try to distance themselves from the Lord and they live in guilt and shame. And other people, they take the religious way. You know what they do? They try to overcompensate in other areas of their life, hoping if they're extra good in this area, God won't, no won't notice this area in which they are weak. Well, Hebrews chapter four says, listen, your great high priest who died for you is able to sympathize with your weaknesses. And he, he himself, speaking of Jesus, when he was on earth, he was tempted just like we were, and yet he never sinned. So he knows what it's like to be tempted. Jesus, the Bible says, a lot of people don't like to hear this because they think it takes away from the fact that Jesus is God. But remember, Jesus was also human. 
He was a man. And the Bible speaks of him at times being tired, being wearied. Listen, Jesus had emotions. He felt things. And at all times, he was able to submit what he felt, to submit what he thought, submit himself in times of temptation to the will of the Father. And he never sinned. That's what makes him the perfect Lamb of God to die on your behalf and mine. But he's not only the Lamb of God, he's the great high priest. So when you're struggling in your weakness, you don't have to run and hide from God. You run to God. Why? Because your great high priest says, I know what she's going through. I, I was tempted in that way. I know what this one's going through. I was tempted in that way. And I'm going to make intercession for them that they become stronger and overcome and resist the temptation and get breakthrough. See, that's an awesome thing. And that's why the rest of that verse says this. We should with confidence draw near to the throne of grace with confidence. Listen, you ought to have confidence as a Christian that you are welcomed into the throne room of God where he will give you grace for your weakness. So when you fail, when you sin, when you blow it, when you say something, think something or do something that is sinful, don't run from God. Don't be afraid of him. That the whole reason Jesus died was to open access for you to the father. Don't be afraid of the one that you sinned against. Run to Jesus, your high priest, and receive help right there with confidence, with boldness, as the King James used to say. With boldness, we enter into the throne room of God. And what do we find? Not anger, not wrath, not condemnation, not frustration, not rejection. The Bible says in Romans 4.16 that we find mercy, we find grace, we find God's help in our hour of need. Do you see why you shouldn't be afraid of them? It's just not spiritually reasonable. Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is willing to receive you. Jesus doesn't need you to be super Christian. You just have to be super honest as a Christian and run to him with confidence in your weakness in your time of need. Let me give you another verse. When we are in Colossians chapter two, and I'll just be honest with you, uh, back in February, I was reading the book of Colossians every day for a long time. God's really got me in the book of Colossians in this recent season. And I'm going to give you some astounding verses from Colossians chapter two. This is what it says. And you, he's speaking to Christians, people that are Christians now. He says, you Christians were dead previously, formerly, you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You, God has made alive together with him. God has made you alive together with Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he has set aside, nailing it to his cross. Guys, those may be some of the most encouraging verses in this little message I'm giving you today. I want you to understand just how forgiven you are. Why are people afraid of God? Why are Christians living afraid of God? One of the reasons is they just don't know how comprehensively forgiven that they actually are. You are fully, 100%, 100% fully forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ for all of your sins. Past sins, forgiven. Present sin, forgiven. Future sins, atoned for, forgiven when they occur. Now that's not cheap grace, that is Bible doctrine. It's called soteriology. It is the doctrine of salvation. We're talking about the blood of Jesus. Jesus can't forgive somebody 98% because that 2% that wouldn't be forgiven is worthy of condemnation in hell. You have to be fully forgiven or there is no salvation. So let's walk through those Colossians verses again. It says, you were dead in the trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. What that means is he's talking to former Gentiles. He's saying to you, you sinned intentionally against God when you didn't know him. You lived a certain way. You lived in rebellion. You lived in immorality. You lived indulging your flesh. You lived outside of the covenant of God. You had no hope. You had no promises. You were blind and ignorantly blind, but you every day you were sinning against the God you did not know. That's really, really bad news. And by by the way, that describes you and me from the coming out of the womb until we are born again. We are sinners. When you are born again, your identity is no longer that primarily of a sinner, but a saint. But until 
you are born again until you trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in multiple places, you're dead in your trespasses. Trespasses is a, a word that describes a certain mode or representation of sin. We can have sinful thoughts. We can have sinful attitudes. We can sin ignorantly sometimes. But a trespass is that type of sin where you know you're doing something wrong and you do it anyway. And the, Paul goes for that big type of sin, the, the worst kind of sin, when you directly and intentionally disobey the God of heaven. And he says, God has taken those trespasses and forgiven them all. That's Colossians 2.13. Forgiven them all. Now, friends, that's grace. That's mercy. That is compassion. That is love. And God didn't wait for you to work off those sins because you couldn't work off those sins. The only payment to work off a sin is the work that Jesus did by dying on the cross. So Jesus, when he died on the cross, paid for your worst sin and the worst amount of sins you've ever done. And the Bible says, now this isn't Jeffology, this is Bible. The Bible says he's forgiven you all of your trespasses. Every act of rebellion forgiven under the blood of Jesus Christ, 100% past, present, and future. People don't like it when I talk about future sins being forgiven. Well, let me just tell you, when Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, all of your sins were yet future. He paid in the past to die for all of your sins that were yet future. And so they're covered, they're paid for. How did he do it? Verse 14 of Colossians 2, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This Jesus set aside, nailing it to his cross. My goodness, that is so um, motivating, so relieving, so encouraging. It removes the fear. Why? Because it is a very direct and violent description of what it took to get you forgiven. Jesus took all of your sins and the demands of the law for those sins. Your sins mean that you deserve to die and go to hell. That's not very popular teaching, but it is Bible. Again, not Jeffology, but Bible doctrine. All of your sins make you worthy of one thing, condemnation and hell forever and ever separated from God. But in God's mercy, compassion and grace and love for you, Jesus came and took the punishment. He took the legal demands that were on you and he put them on himself. And so all of the guilt that you would have, all of the shame that you would have, all of the condemnation that you would have, all of the separation between you and God, Jesus took that upon himself and he took all of your sins and all of your judicial guilt before a holy God. And the Bible says he nailed it to the cross. Listen to me, especially those of you that are Christians. All of your guilt and shame has been nailed to the cross and it's under the blood and you are not underneath it anymore. If you don't believe that, that then in some way you're going to be living beneath the freedom that God has given you in Jesus Christ. Very quickly, if you're not a Christian, I need to tell you something. All of the violence that came against Jesus on the cross and before the cross when he was being tried and all the beatings, all the wrath of man that came against him, all the punishment, that's actually over you right now if you're not in Christ. All the wrath of God abides over you right now. And your only hope is to turn to the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Lord, and say, Jesus, I'm guilty. I can't hide. I can't run. I can't work it off. I can't get away from it. Lord, I need rescue. I need help. Jesus, I need you to nail my sins to your cross and deliver me from my guilt and the penalty of it. You see, the lamb was slaughtered so that you could go free. His blood paid for your sin and they're all forgiven if you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ, I say this lovingly, but I say it as a stern warning. You're guilty before a holy God and you should be afraid, but only to the degree that you refuse to trust Jesus. If you will trust him right now in your own personal surrender, the wrath of God will be forever taken off of you and the grace of God will be yours. I've just got a few more minutes left. Let me give you this. For those of you that are living in fear of God, afraid of God every day, you're distanced from him. You're not close to him. You don't enjoy him. You don't really feel like you even know him. He's more of just the big, scary God out there in the sky somewhere. But you consider yourself a Christian. Let me just give you this verse from 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment, 
And whoever fears has not yet been perfected in love. Guys, that's huge. That tells me right there that God does not want us to live in a state of fear, a state of being afraid, a state of uncertainty, a state of keep a distance from big, scary God, or a state of, oh, God's good with me as long as I'm doing my best, as long as I'm doing works, as long as I'm serving, as long as I'm giving, as long as I don't commit a sin. Therefore, I'm earning God's love, so I better keep up this performance, because if I ever underperform with God, then I'm going to be in trouble with Him. That's a miserable way to live. Let me just go ahead and tell you, you will sin. You will fail. You will fall. It doesn't mean your life is going to implode. It doesn't mean you can live in a pattern of sin. But the idea that you might live 100% of the time, every hour, every day, every week, every month, and live that perfectly in alignment with God's nature and God's holy perfection, that means every thought you have, every word you have, everything you do for every day, every week, every month, every year is perfectly in alignment with God. Well, friends, I don't think that that's actual. Matter of fact, I know it's not. We do sin. So if we are afraid that when we sin, we lose everything that Jesus has provided for us. If we are afraid that we, if we don't keep up our performance, then God's not going to love us or accept us anymore. That's being afraid of God. And that's not what his desire is for you as a Christian. The fact is, is when you sin, you go to that throne room of grace I talked about. You remind yourself that all of your payment has been nailed to the cross. It's been paid for. And what that does is it helps you to be victorious over sin. I hate sin. People say, Jeff, you're preaching this grace that's so free. You're going to tell people to go out and sin as much as they want to because the penalty has been paid. Well, let me just tell you something. I sin as much as I want to. I sin more than I want to because I don't want to. You see, my friends, I don't want to sin and I don't pursue sin. And the reality that Jesus has paid for my sin doesn't motivate me to sin more. That is an unregenerate heart. That is somebody who's got a false understanding of the gospel because the same gospel that frees you from the penalty of sin frees you from the power of sin. You become a new creation. Old things pass away and behold, all things become new. And so therefore we become new in Jesus Christ. So listen, friends, I want to wrap all of this up. The fear of judgment for the Christian is gone. Jesus was judged for you. Stop living afraid of God. You don't honor the Father when you're afraid of Him. Live in a holy, reverential awe of God. Love Him, trust Him, go to Him, run to Him quickly. And know that you're accepted in the Beloved and that you're complete in Jesus Christ. That's the way Christians have to live. That's the way I want to live. That's the way I want my family to live. The church that I shepherd at the church at Winder, I want them to live that way. And my friends, you that are watching, I want you to live that way. Because living afraid of God is not the will of God for your life. There's so much more that he has planned for you. So no need to be afraid of him anymore. You're, if you're in Christ, your sins are gone and your soul is free. We'll see you next time on Truth Shots.